Hey everybody, it's Matt Sheriffs. Welcome to the SBI Podcast. Our guest today is Randolph Carter, the VP of Marketing for North America for rent a kill Randolph brings a wealth of experience from his role heading rent a kills expanded marketing efforts across all of North America. I really think you're gonna enjoy the show. From SBI's Executive Briefing Center in Dallas, Texas, the most watched and listened to content in B2B sales and marketing, it's the SBI Podcast with your host, Matt Shares. Welcome to the SBI Podcast, a weekly show dedicated to helping you make your number. Today, we're going to demonstrate how to capture the attention of customers and prospects through campaign strategy and planning. So why this topic? Every market has a sweet spot. So marketing campaigns and their budgets generate revenues when focused directly at this sweet spot. Campaigns that are not hyper-targeted do not. So to generate return on marketing campaign dollars, it requires a clear objective, a timeline, budget, accurate lists, correct media mix, and compelling calls to action. Yeah, all that stuff. So my name is Matt Sheris. I'm the CEO of SBI, and I am your host. Joining me in the studio is my beloved co-host, Melissa Valdez. And Melissa's here to point you to resources to advance you along the way to making your number. Hi, Melissa. Hi, Matt. I'm so happy to be here with you today, and welcome to our listeners. Very good. So joining us is Randolph Carter. Randolph's the VP of Marketing for North America for rent a kill So Randolph, welcome to the show, and please introduce yourself to the audience. Matt, thank you very much, and hi, everyone. Uh, Randolph Carter here. Uh, uh, I, as, I, as Matt said, VP of Marketing for North America. It doesn't sound like it with the accent I've got. <laughs> I've been with the company in the U.S. for about three years, but uh, 10 years overall, um, having done a variety of global and local marketing director roles. And previous to that, I was with uh, BP Lubricants, Castrol, better known as in most markets, and then uh, a company called ICI before. So now move back to, uh, here to the U.K., but uh, looking forward to talking about the, uh, my American experiences. Very good. So, Randolph, a little fun fact. You know, obviously, just the way you sound, everything has like a 20% intelligence accelerator because of your accent. So we're already off to a great start. But I also understood that yeah, you were a standout tennis and rugby player. Is that true? Too true. Too true until very recently when I uh, snapped my or ruptured my Achilles tendon. So sadly, those days are gone. Oh man! Well, here's, I'm, I'm glad that I actually have you via the video because anybody that plays rugby, like my partner Mike Drapeau, they love to scrum and they love violence, and I don't want anything getting messed up in the studio. So I like you right where you are. So uh, Melissa, the the audience might want to follow along. Uh, can you explain to them how to do so? Yes. Hopefully, audience, you have your 2018 How to Make Your Number Workbook. If not, you need to get a copy. Um, we'll be on the marketing strategy section, page. Phase six, campaign planning, and it starts on page 264. All right, so let's jump into the questions. So as a background for the audience, Randolph, as you think about your experience running campaigns and how you've evolved to the point you are today, can you share a little bit about that evolution just to help ground the audience in this big, meaty topic known as marketing campaigns? Absolutely, and it's it's interesting. I've been, as I said, with Rentable for about 10 years, and over that time, um, I've tried every which way but almost loose to quote Clint Eastwood to try and get uh, you know, uh, marketing campaigns to work. And, and to be honest with you, it's been a challenge. Um, uh, most of them have been marketing-led. Most of them, well, I've tried everything. I've tried direct mail, phone and direct mail, email phone, direct mail, just train the sales guys, uh, give them incentives. And I think, you know, during all that time, what's interesting is, I think I've had all the right elements in doing this, but never had quite the right recipe. Uh, and, and so it's become a bit of a personal challenge for me, yeah. to be honest with you, to go and find a way of making this work. And I'm glad to say over the last couple of years in North America, I think we found a model that, uh, that started to do that, exactly that. Okay. So that's a, a perfect segue. So I guess we're going to unpack each one of these things. So for those listening, if you sort of think about a marketing campaign, you want to have objectives, you want to have a timeline, you want to have a budget, and you got to have expected results. So Randolph, kind of walking through that continuum, talk a little bit about campaign objectives first. How do you think about objectives when you go into a campaign? And you think about rent-a-kill and just the size 
of the company that you all are. And maybe this would be a great way for you to ground the audience in what Rent to Kill does. How do you think about campaign objectives? Okay. Well, just very quickly, first of all, on Rent to Kill, uh, we are a, a national and an international pest control company primarily. Although in the United States, we also have uh, indoor plant scaping, as we call it, yep. uh, under a brand called Ambius and a couple of other businesses as well. But our, our main one is pest control. And uh, when it comes to setting objectives, you know, and the way to think about it is organic growth. We're a company that's uh, growing both organically and through acquisition. But yep. our key target, as I say, is growing organically. Yep. And um, there are lots of ways of doing that. And the campaign is certainly one that's gaining in importance for us uh, over the last couple of years. Yep. So, Randolph, when you think as we get a little more focused around an objective and knowing that in the pest control business, it can be very reactive, right? I walk into my house. Oh, my goodness. Right. My wife panics. Termites. Right. It's a, this this here comes the demand. So is there a motion that you all run relative to an objective where, you know, whether it's by region that there's certain sorts of things that happen at certain times of year where it's almost like you just have to be there to catch the demand. Talk a little bit about that relative to objective setting. So our business is is really split into two areas. There's the residential business, yep. which is, as you say, uh, all of our I won't say that, but many people were walking into the house seeing a mouse and screaming and looking yeah. for a hero to come and save them. Yep. Uh, and then there's the commercial side of the business. And uh, so on the residential side, we don't really run campaigns per se like that. It's, it's much more a question of being there, making sure your brand's known yep. and moving forward. I think more interestingly, perhaps, with the audience today is on the commercial side, uh, You know, how do we think about our goals and objectives there and how do we how do we start to do that? And uh, and for us, it starts at the beginning of the year when we're doing, or before the beginning of the year, if we're talking calendar years, um, where we're starting to do our annual planning and sitting down with the sales team, the sales directors, and agreeing with them and saying, okay, we're going to do campaigns. How many should we do? When should we run them? And typically, you know, uh, you know who should we target them on? Yeah. So we do two to three campaigns a year. They're big events. They last uh, three to four months each. Um and yeah, that's that's the start of it. Is sitting down, agreeing with sales, so that it goes in our plan and their plan. Very good. Um, so Randolph, that's when, that's that's yeah. helpful for the audience. So audience members, as you think about what Randolph said, and you say, well, what does this matter to me? A couple of things that you might notice: three to four big campaigns focused around a timeline, and there's this interlock that he mentioned around sales being in the room and being part of that. So Randolph, how do you think about budget? Right, because the one thing that we always know, the big rumor is sales guys make money, marketing guys spend money. So you get to spend it all. And I, I, know, uh, I know you're president and CEO and he loves ROIs. So talk to me about the budget component and expected results. How do you balance that and, and think through that over the span of that year? So, I mean, when it comes to the budget setting, as you say, uh, my boss is very, very keen on ROI. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's good that after a couple of years now, uh, I think we've got our model down pretty clear. We've actually got enough experience to go back and say, look, if we invest this amount of money, John, we're going to get this return. And actually, um, we've now got a model that's delivering double market growth rates of uh, growth in the sectors mm. we're targeting on through our campaigning. So, uh, you know, the budget we break down into, as I say, marketing and sales enablement. On the marketing side, we're looking at pay-per-click. Uh, we have an in-house creative team, so we don't incur too many expenses there, but we do do some advert trade, trade advertising, a bit yep. of PR. But, you know, we build that budget overall, and then we look at that, and we say to the sales team, okay, what do you think you can achieve um, in order to sales growth? And, and then we measure the return on investment on that incremental sales growth versus the budget we spent to achieve it. All right, very helpful. So that, that's actually a good segue. So I've got a budget, I've got a timeline, I've got an objective and then expected results. So now let's talk a little bit about addressable markets. You guys are, as you said, international, right? And there's it's such a big market. So how do you think about allocating people, money and time against your sweet spot in this addressable market? There's pests everywhere. Right, and someone's got to take care of them. But how do you think through that that addressable market? Well, you know, as you're touching on, that's the joys of pest control. The world <laughs> is our addressable market. To be honest with you, no kidding. Um, so, 
Yeah, well, uh, yeah, and, and literally anywhere there's a, an animal people don't want, that's a pest, yeah. a like a weed. But yep. uh, yeah, so you're, you're so right. It's really about focusing. So the way that we think about that is we uh, segment our market uh, kind of by industry type, okay. um, and we focus on, so for example, for us, People we know need pest control pretty much year round at commercial businesses, especially those uh, whose brand can be damaged by a pest infestation, who've got uh, financial impact could be fairly large. And I'm thinking about sectors like food processing yeah. and logistics, pharmaceuticals, yeah. food retail, people like that. So, so what we do is we sit down, we, we kind of talk uh, to the sales guys. Again, it's, it's very much a process hand in hand. But we, talk, we look at which segments uh, we think we've got a relatively low share in compared to, to other areas, uh, but where we've got a compelling offer and uh, where we think there's, it's sizable and big enough for us to go after. Yep. Uh, and then once we've got that first segment identified, then we think about the sub-segments or groups within it. Healthcare in the U.S. clearly is an enormous addressable market. Yep. Uh, and you can go to dentists, you could go to hospitals, you go to operating theatres, you could go to care homes. Yep. And so you've got to be really focused on, you can't do all of it, because yep. uh, that would just confuse just our salespeople apart yep. from anyone else. Um, and so we just absolutely focus in on an addressable si market that's got size, scope for growth, and where we have uh, a proposition we think is winning. Very good. So as, you, as we get ready to head into a break here, those of you listening to that first segment, a couple of key things you take away from what Randolph shared. The first is the understanding and the segmentation of the market and the hyper-segmentation that he does underneath that to ensure there's precision and campaign dollars are directed directly at those accounts. Second thing that I heard, Randolph, which was a great point, is your awareness of growth relative to the market. Revenue growth, when measured against your industry and your competitors, as you think about organic growth, that is the baseline, that is the benchmark. So Randolph's precision around measuring against the competition and knowing what the industry is growing is a great way to think about ROI. So we're gonna take a quick break from this interview and Melissa has got something that she's gonna share with you. Yes, Matt, so I'm really excited to share with the audience our new web-based self-assessment tool. It's the SBI Revenue Growth Diagnostic. To find that tool, you'll go to sbi.tips forward slash revenue growth diagnostic. And what this tool does is it allows you to self-assess against the industry leaders in your market and uh, helps you make your target for this year. Mm. Kind of like getting a scale nobody gets to see how much I weigh unless I really want to share <laughs> Well, that and with the scale, it doesn't give you a roadmap as an output to how to get to your goal. However, this tool does. So it's anything's better than a scale, right? Yes. This tool is definitely better than a yes. scale. Yes. Very good. Very good. All right. So you're listening to the SBI mm -hmm. podcast. Welcome back. I'm your host, Matt Shares. And today's guest is Randolph Carter, the Vice President of Marketing for North America for rent -to kill So today we've been demonstrating how to capture the attention of customers and prospects through campaigns. So we're going to jump back into the questions. So, Randolph, how do you make sure your campaign message is provocative and differentiated? And, and the thing I think about this with your business, you said we have two very clear segments. We have commercial, we have residential, and they have different things. So let's maybe talk through messaging and, and how you're provocative with that as a backdrop. Sounds good. So um, if I think about the commercial side first, you know, when we're developing a campaign, the first thing we do is uh, our research into the, the chosen sector or segment or segment yeah. and subsectors. And we create and we write what uh, we call our kind of our segment Bible. And our mm -hmm. segment Bible is a really in-depth look into everything we can find, mainly through desk research and contacts, about that segment. So we'll look at the trends uh, within healthcare, for example. We'll look at uh, who are the people making decisions and who are the influencers and what are their motives, what are their needs. We'll look at uh, where are those people shopping online, where are they doing their research, what forums are they looking at. Um, and we'll go through all of that. We'll look at the competition. Uh, you know, so it's a really exhaustive piece of work to make sure we've, we really understand the sector and the segment overall. And from that, then, the marketing managers will work uh, with our creative team to kind of distill it and come up with the themes yep. for the campaign around which we base all our communications, all of the, the propositions, et cetera, and drive that through. Um, 
on the residential side, you know, we've developed our, our proposition, which is called Pest Free 365. Yep. Um, and that's much more, again, about, you know, understanding customers and consumers and really getting again into that detail in the nitty gritty, the, the secret to the source is that final drop of detail, but getting into really understanding what it is they're looking for. And it's hard to differentiate in the pest control market at yeah. the end of the day. Uh, we, we've got people uh, who we train incredibly highly to go around and do a great job, but they're using many of the same tools that our competitors are sure. using. So differentiating is, uh, is critical. So I love, and I'm going to take that term of the segment Bible. So for those of you that are listening, you might feel like you are uh, not as biblical as you need to be because you don't have a segment Bible. So I think if there was an action for you to take, understanding your segments, and if you think about the precision with which Randolph articulated the value props around what they do, it's very, very clear. So I think, Randolph, on that point, the a marriage that I've loved to watch over the years is this great union between sales and marketing as they fight each other. So how do you incorporate both sales and marketing together to execute an integrated campaign and, and have that interlock? How, do, how does that work for you guys? Well, just to pick up on your language, it's, it's, it, it's not a biblical fight. Let me put it that way. <laughs> um, so Actually, you know, I'm really glad to say that we've worked hard over the last few years to, to become true friends with sales, as it should be. Marketing and sales work together. And so the way we do it is, again, as I said, we start at the, the, the beginning of the year with our annual planning and make sure that we've got their buy-in into the plans. When we then get to preparing the campaign itself, uh, typically we take about three months before we launch the campaign. We'll sit down and establish a project team, yeah. which will be senior sales guys, yeah. uh, the marketing managers, creative people, the online people. And, and really importantly for me as well are the sales training uh, people that we've got in the team as well. And, and that's one of the really critical links that's worked well for us is thinking about, okay, we're going to be attacking this sector or segment. You know, we've got our well over 100 sales guys out yeah. there. And, and so we've got a mixture of ability and knowledge between them. And so we need to make sure that they all really understand their customers yeah. so that they're confident in speaking to them and putting forward our proposition. And so sales training is a critical part of that. What we do is rather than say, hey, look, we've got a three-month campaign. We're going to launch it with a big bang on Friday. And on Monday, we're going to train everyone and then we're going to let them get on with it. Uh, that's kind of where I think things have gone wrong for me in the past in, in doing this. So what we've been doing more recently is saying, okay, we've got three months. We're going to every two weeks, we're going to drip a bit more content and a bit more knowledge about the sectors and mm. our propositions into these guys. So over three months, they build their knowledge. And one of our goals, uh, Matt, in, in these campaigns, not only is to grow sales, yeah. but it's also to increase the capability of our sales force overall in that, not in that particular sector. So, they can continue to sell successfully in it well beyond the period of the campaign. Wow. So, Randolph, what I what I love about that is, to your point of the, the episodic launch, right? Hey, it's Monday. We're in the conference room. Here's the campaign. And then all the air goes out of the balloon over the next 12 weeks as people start to get fatigued. And what I heard from you, you're creating endurance athletes. And the way you're doing that is through this constant reinforcement that after the campaign is over, you know, some of this segment Bible knowledge has become permanent inside the sales organization. So for those listening, you think about that execution discipline. I mean, that's what I take from that. So I guess, Randolph, on that point, if you think about the offers and the calls to action for the campaign. So I work at Ranakill. I'm getting dripped this knowledge. We know the segment. We know the sub-segment. I know exactly what I do and the problem I solve. Are there different types of compelling offers and calls to action that you all have experimented with and that you've tried? Like, how do you think about creating those? Again, I, I go back, I, I'm becoming repetitive, and I don't mean to be, but, uh, you know, the, the, the Bible uh, is really important to us. And, and yeah. we start with the Bible because it provides that insight and understanding yeah. of the customer. And, and again, then from there, it's, a, it's about really working through what is the compelling proposition we've got. Yeah. And it's important, I think, for a compelling proposition clearly has to answer a customer problem or yeah. issue. Um, but it also, I, I'm a firm believer, and you have to have two elements to it, a rational side and maybe a more emotional side, because at the end of the day, actually, as human beings, we all make 
decisions emo- with the emotional part of our brain, yep. which is informed by the rational part of our brain. Yep. So, uh, you know, so for example, in our Ambius business, which is our plant business, when we are addressing that uh, healthcare sector, you know, we the theme, if you will, that we came up with uh, for the proposition overall was improving the patient experience by design. Mm. Because we know that uh, you know healthcare facilities are all about patient experience, and yeah. we know that our proposition were really strong when it comes to plant design work and helping healthcare hospitals, etc., work out what plants to put where in order to bring down the stress levels of patients, make those waiting times more bearable, that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, so, so that's the kind of detail you get into. But again, you know improving patient experience by design i think has that nice balance of yeah there's some rational stuff in it uh, versus the emotional piece that also meets the needs of, of the customer in terms of patient experience so randolph i could not agree with you more <clears throat> the concept of sometimes a few of my peers they call it the emotional narrative right it's mm-hmm. one thing to rationally or academically appeal to somebody it's another thing when you have a buyer persona of who your customer is and you know their objectives, their obstacles, and their fears. As you think about things like suspicion, skepticism, naivete, vulnerability, those emotions, that's what compel people to take a call to action. So I think that's, that's a great point for the audience to take away. So we're going to take another break right now. And before we do that, Melissa because you are packing all kinds of goodies today. I think you've got something else you're going to share with the audience. (laughs) Yes, I do, Matt. Uh, Audience, if you could benefit from anything that Randolph and Matt have discussed today, and I think there have been a lot of pearls of wisdom going along our gem theme here, um, consider spending time in an interactive workshop. The SBI team of experts is here to help you. You might even consider flying down to Dallas to visit our beautiful, brand-new executive briefing center, the studio. We'd love to have you. Of course, we're happy to come to you as well. But to get a feel for what's covered in these workshops, you'll go to sbi.tips forward slash 2018 workbook. Again, that is where you can download your workbook, not if you're in the car or if you're running on the treadmill. But uh, certainly go get your copy of the workbook and also get a feel for what's covered in these workshops. All right. Fantastic. One of the cool things about our studio, we've got a bar in it. So if the workshop's not going well, we just head out, we start drinking. We work hard, we play hard, right? That's right. All right, so this is our last segment with Randolph. This has been a lot of fun, demonstrating how to capture the attention of customers and prospects as we think about marketing strategy. So, Randolph, one of the things that people struggle with is the concept of selecting the right channels. And what I mean, just to ground everybody, when I say channels, think email, think paid banner advertising, think outbound calling, think events, and there's 40 others that I could list off. So, Randolph, how do you think through channel selection when it comes to campaigns? A few few ways, Matt. I I guess the first thing I'd say in the short answer is measure the heck out of everything you do Um, because without that, you're you're shooting in the dark. So we measure the heck out of everything we do, um, and that allows us to know which channels are most effective in general, when we're talking about these things. And then when we come to uh, the, this particular campaign, uh, then we can go back to our Bible, as we yeah. do, yep. uh, and you know, we find out which channels uh, our target audience are looking at, they're visiting, their their what websites, what trade associations, that kind of thing they're into. And then we match the two things together. So we know that this kind of advertising works, and then here's the channel we're going to put it through. And, and a great example of that is, again, in our Ambius business, um, but we do this on Pest as well, yeah. the, uh, we've been doing some trade advertising through banner, banner ads on websites. Yeah. And, and through the results and the fact you can, tra- you can track all of this thanks to the joys of Google Analytics and the yeah. like, uh, you know, we now know that a, a vertical banner performs better than a horizontal banner on the homepage. And you kind of go, wow. But, but you know, we can see a, a really a fairly big difference in click-through rates between those two positions on the page. Mm. So, you know, you measure everything, you, you marry your knowledge of what works you generally with specific uh, channels allied to uh, your, your Bible insights, and that's how we think it through. So, I mean, Randolph, there's a consistent theme that you're pulling through, you know, our time together. The, a lot of people want to be revenue marketers, right? Marketing folks that really drive revenue. And there's a theme that you have around measurement, data, right? Knowing your segments, 
rapidly iterating as things are working and not working and being maniacal. Like, I mean, the fact that you know vertical over versus horizontal relative to a banner ad, I mean, that is an advanced application of paying attention and thinking about a dollar of marketing spend and what it generates. So for those that are, that are listening in on this, you see this constant, this consistent theme from Randolph around the precision of the data that he's using, but also thinking with a revenue uh, element to it, as opposed to just, hey, marketing's gonna go off and run campaigns, we spend X amount of dollars, this is what we do. So knowing that, Randolph, let's talk a little bit about the, the buyer's journey. How do you make sure that the campaigns have enough content at the right points? And the one thing I heard you say earlier is that you actually brought internal creative and internal content marketing as a capability that reports up through you. So talk a little bit about content, right points of the journey, and sort of how you manage that through the life cycle. Again, uh, I'm boring myself at this point, Matt, because I'm going to mention the bloody Bible word again. I shouldn't swear. That's a British no, you, That's okay. Podcast. That's British. It's allowed. Um, <laughs> And it sounds 20% in time, so that's good. So uh, so we'll be all right. But yeah, I mean, again, we go to the Bible. So that really helps us understand the buyer journey. Yep. We can map that out. And clearly, we've got the marketing and sales funnel coming through. Uh, and so we work really hard on the PR content uh, and thinking about, look, what, what's going to raise our brand, position the brand yep. well at the beginning when people are starting to think about, gosh, maybe I need a plant or a pest control or whatever it may be. Um, as we go down that then, we're very focused on, okay, now they've got a need. At this point in time, they're doing their research. We know what their concerns are and how they're thinking about it. We know what the forums are. So we yeah. track, again, as I said, LinkedIn and all that kind of thing. And then we write content specific for yeah. that. Um, at the same time, we're thinking about our web content, our pay-per-click ads, and how we're going to run those campaigns to go through it. And finally, clearly, the content for the sales guys to make sure that when you've got the lead, when they've made the phone call, they've got the appointment, they can sit down and they've got a compelling story and the right collateral, whatever that may be, to actually present a compelling case yeah. to the customer that really resonates with them. And not only at that point, which I think is important, it's at every point through the funnel, they've yep. got a consistent message driven yep. down. Yep. Yeah, I mean, one of the things, Randolph, I hear from you when you talk about that and, and that I think the folks would find this, this concept of understanding the buyer's journey, but really, I guess, the front end of that, thinking about trigger events, something that we always listen for. There's two types of trigger events. There's the proactive ones and there's reactive ones. There's things that a buyer says, boy, we need to be proactive. I'm in pharmaceuticals, a pest, I, I, I cannot have a pest situation, so I'm gonna have a proactive maintenance program. And then there's the reactive trigger, right, to your point, mouse in the house, I panic, but then you guys, your ability to convert that reactive, you know, one moment in time to an ongoing paying customer. I think about, you know, who I use at, at our home, who comes every single quarter. I'm not even sure what we, what we spend with you all, but I know we're spending something and it's just the preventative maintenance. So I think, as I think about our last question, talk about people and systems, you know, relative to these inquiries that come. I mean, you generate this interest after all of this work and all of the execution of the Bible. How do you make sure you have people there to convert the inquiries into buyer interest? So, I mean, uh, again, I think you're absolutely right to point out that we've got commercial and residential, especially with this question, because the response mechanism and systems are really, really very different. So. On the residential side, we've got an inside sales team who are yep. dedicated to answering the phone. And when my wife is screaming, standing on the stairs, is there to offer a calm voice and reassurance and quick responsiveness. Uh, and so it's really about that human touch with yeah. them. And they're very well trained in the way they do that. Um, and I hope you feel like you're getting great value from your pest control, Matt. <laughs> um, and then on the commercial side, what we try and do is get it out to our field sales guys yeah. pretty quickly. So it's about making the appointments getting them in front of the customer so they can start building a relationship as soon as possible. You know, we, we don't believe there should be multiple touch points between an inside salesperson and ex outside. Get them straight to the person who's going to be that relationship manager as soon as you can do. Very good. All right. So, uh, Randolph, I got to tell you, that was a great demonstration of what it means to be a revenue marketer, specifically around campaigns and strategy. So thank you so much for contributing to our body of knowledge in this area. Really appreciate your time. No, not at all. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Matt. And we want to thank the SBI audience for tuning in. 
we appreciate your continued support. Got one more goodie for you from Melissa. So Melissa, what do you have to tell our friends? <laughs> Well, Matt, besides that I have a fun fact that I'm a champion bug killer, so this is a very, very nice. fascinating conversation to me very nice. combined with marketing. But anyhow, uh, we don't want you to miss out. Whether you're a first-time listener or you've been with us for a long time, please make sure that you're registered at SBI, I'm sorry, salesbenchmarkindex.com forward slash register. There you can select your topics of interest to you and when you want to receive these pieces of information. So it's very customized like everything we do here at SBI. Awesome. Thank you. All right, folks, that's it for today. As always, until next time, I wish you good luck as you try and make your number. This has been the SBI Podcast. For more information on the studio, SBI's Executive Briefing Center, our team, or to schedule a workshop, please visit salesbenchmarkindex.com.